Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the McConnell Center, all those on watching on uh, YouTube today or listening to this as a podcast uh, down the road. We appreciate you all being here. Thanks particularly to the teachers today taking your time to be here exploring Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America with us and improving your skill set and knowledge to be better stewards of our young people in Kentucky, our young citizens. Today we start a year-long project here at the McConnell Center exploring Alexis de Tocqueville's masterful Democracy in America. It's certainly, I think, the most important book on America ever written by a foreigner, but it may be the most important book ever written about America, uh, I think, and about democracy and political culture. We ask you all today to join us in a year-long effort to read Democracy in America. And for those online joining us, here's how you can do that. You can begin by picking up your copy of Democracy in America. We recommend the Liberty Fund edition because this is the edition that all of our programs are going to be um, linked uh, to. If you buy your copy of Democracy in America, you can then go to the McConnell Center uh, website. It's mcconnellcenter.org, mcconnellcenter.org, and there's a tab there that's entitled Tocqueville's America and Ours. You click that and you will find things like a reading guide to help you get through uh, a, about nine months of reading Democracy in America and links to our videos like the ones, the one that we are doing today that will be done all, all year. You'll also find links to our podcast, Vital Remnants, in which our speaker today, John Wilsey, and I will be guiding you through a reading of Democracy in America over these next, uh, next nine months. And you can find that podcast wherever you find, uh, you listen to your podcast. But the link is on the McConnellCenter.org. It's going to be a really fantastic year. I hope you'll join us. I hope you'll be part of the conversation with us. I hope maybe you'll even form reading groups. I understand uh, there is a reading group that is attached to our, um, our reading guide that um, has just started. I can't say exactly where this is, but let's say it is at a certain military school that you've probably heard of that hopefully we'll be able to announce at some point. But nonetheless, it's the beginning of, uh, of reading groups. I hope they'll be around the country uh, using, our, uh, using our guide and following along with us. I think there's never been a year that where Tocqueville's words have been more important for us to hear than they are in 2023 and 2024, and I hope you'll agree. Well, today we have the distinct pleasure of having with us Dr. John Wilsey. John is my co-lead faculty for this project. He is an associate professor of church history and philosophy and the chair of the history department at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary here in Louisville, Kentucky. He's also a research fellow at the Center for Religion, Culture, and Democracy. He's the author of three books, including his latest, God's Cold Warrior, The Life and Faith of John Foster Dulles, uh, which there is a, a great podcast of you having a conversation uh, with me at the McConnell Center podcast, so you might want to listen to that, about that, uh, that book uh, as well. And he's also, and he became, uh, you know, on my radar um, several years ago, when he moved to Louisville and we started doing some joint programming for soldiers um, on um, um, democracy in America. And he came to my attention because he is also the editor of his very own edition of Democracy in America, an abridged edition. So I highly suggest you get the full edition and the abridged edition. Um, so this is a smaller edition, but all the essentials are here. Um, and um, so John is, we're thrilled to have him. He's a real expert on democracy in America, on Alexis de Tocqueville. 
Um, so John, it's a pleasure to have you as my co-lead faculty for this year uh, and to welcome you to the McConnell Center today. Ladies and gentlemen, John Wilson. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. <clears throat> well, it's great to be with you, and thank you so much, Dr. Gregg, for that very kind introduction, and thanks to the McConnell Center and the University of Louisville for uh, allowing me to be here and, and to, to be with you and talk about Tocqueville. Uh, a wonderful, a wonderful and fascinating man and subject. Uh, with, uh, with regards to democracy in America, it's, there's a strange irony at work here. And that is that um, Alexis de Tocqueville is almost universally regarded as uh, the most important uh, foreigner and, the, and the, having produced the most important work on America uh, that's ever been produced. And yet, very few people have actually read <laughs> Democracy in America. Uh, sometimes you hear people quoting uh, Democracy in America and um, if, you, if you have read it and if you know the text well, uh, you know that uh, one of the most famous quotes uh, that's thrown around is a misquote that Tocqueville never actually said, America is great because she is good and when she ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. That's, that's not a Tocqueville statement at all. But you do hear a lot of politicians, uh, especially around election time, uh, use that quote and it's a little bit cringy, as the kids say. Uh, the title of the book suggests that it will be almost an intuitive book, Democracy in America. But people often find that it is um, somewhat, uh, somewhat long. You might even have seen uh, the two-volume Liberty Fund edition that you have and thought, oh my goodness, this thing is really huge. Uh, two really big texts. Um, you know, if you have, uh, if you have a, a, a fishing boat or something like that, it's a good anchor. Um, if you have a heavy door that you need a doorstop for, this serves well for that. Uh, so some people are kind of intimidated by the length. Some people are intimidated by the style. Uh, it is, a, of course, written by a foreigner, a Frenchman, and a 19th century Frenchman at that, and um, it can also seem rather plodding. I think that that's, uh, I think those are, you know, all understandable, but um, Democracy in America is a fascinating read, um, and an, an amazingly prescient mind um, that Tocqueville had. Every American citizen should read Democracy in America because it continues to offer wisdom on how to protect liberty against despotism. And we certainly, that is certainly a very salient concern for today. We don't read Democracy in America, however, like we read any, any book. We don't read it like we read a book on the beach or something like that. We have to have a particular method for doing so. So as we read Democracy in America, we have to consider four contextual elements, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Four contextual elements. Number one, who Tocqueville was. We have to kind of nail down who he was. Number two, why he came to America. Why did he come here? What was his, what was his angle? What was his agenda? Third, what was America like when Tocqueville came to visit? And third, how was the book received and how is it useful today? If we bear in mind the context of Tocqueville's work, we can more readily appreciate its meaning and its relevance to us. So who, first of all, who, who was he? Who was Alexis, Alexis de Tocqueville? Well, he was born in 1805. He died in 1859. He was born into an ancient, moderately wealthy yet aristocratic family in France. His, his family, both on his father's side and on his mother's side, suffered greatly during the French Revolution. His great-grandfather on his mother's side, his, his aunt on his mother's side, and, and other relatives uh, on both sides of the family were, were arrested during the Reign of Terror, were imprisoned, and were executed. His uh, great-grandfather was beheaded um, after he had been forced to watch uh, that man's daughter, his, his daughter, so Tocqueville's aunt, uh, beheaded. He was forced to watch his daughter beheaded and then he himself went to the scaffold. Um, a, a very difficult time to be alive. His father and his mother were also imprisoned uh, during the reign of terror for about a year um, when they were just, just had been just first married. Um, they were very young. Um, 
late teens, early 20s when they got married and they were thrown into prison. They were released. Uh, they barely survived the experience. Uh, they were released on, on Robespierre's own execution. <coughs> Uh, Tocqueville was raised in his early years by a tutor in the traditional ways of conservative, um, you know, orthodox Catholicism. Um, but the young Alexis broke from conservative and uh, con orthodox Catholicism early in his life. When he was about 16, he discovered uh, the great Enlightenment thinkers in his father's ample library. Uh, thinkers like Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Montesquieu and Voltaire and Pascal. Uh, these are four thinkers that uh, Tocqueville admired very much, read, read their works. Tocqueville never did break with a belief in God. He also had a very strong belief in divine providence. But he also held that religion uh, was uh, something that, um, well, he didn't have a, an, an evangelical religion. Um, he uh, was sort of a nominal Catholic, and, uh, but he did believe that, that religion was indispensable to the cohesion of a civil society, especially a democracy. He entered law school uh, when he was uh, just about 22 years old, became an apprentice judge uh, at Versailles, and he met two people that would be extremely important to him in later life. One, his good friend Gustave de Beaumont, which was his travel companion and lifelong friend. They met in law school uh, in the eight, late 1820s at Versailles. Beaumont uh, came with uh, Tocqueville on the trip to the United States, also wrote a book, wrote a book on slavery, wrote a book on American slavery when he came here, uh, while Tocqueville wrote American uh, Democracy in America. Uh, the second person that he met while he was at Versailles was his wife. Uh, he met Marie Motley while he was in law school, and they were married in 1835. Now, why did Tocqueville come to America? That's a little bit of background on who he was. Why did he come to America? What was his angle? What was his interest? Well, Tocqueville uh, served uh, under the reign of Charles X, who was the last of the Bourbon monarchs. But in 1830, in July of 1830, Charles was deposed during the July Revolution and uh, was succeeded by Louis Philippe, who was uh, Charles's cousin. So his cousin overthrew uh, Charles. And uh, after the July Revolution, all public officials uh, were forced to take an oath of loyalty to Louis Philippe. Now, the Tocqueville family was in a little bit of a pickle. I mean, Tocqueville was in a, was in a little bit of a bind because the family had historically been supporters of the Bourbon monarchy and were supporters of the Bourbon Restoration uh, and supporters of Charles X. So to have to take a loyalty oath to Louis, uh, Louis Philippe, who had overthrown Charles X, was a little bit of a was a little bit of an awkward situation. Um, Tocqueville's career was just starting out. He was a young man. His career path was a little uncertain. And you know, uh, who know who knew at the time that this wasn't going to turn into quite a violent revolution? Maybe something even like the Reign of Terror. So his career was in jeopardy, but his life also may well have been in jeopardy. Tocqueville thought this over, and along with his friend Beaumont, thought this over. And um, they were both interested in America. They were both interested in prison reform. Uh, Louis Philippe was interested in prison reform. Prison reform was sort of in the air in uh, Europe and in America. And um, Prison reform was undergoing some experiments. There, were, there was experimentation in prison reform in America that Tocqueville knew about. And uh, specifically, this was the idea of the penitentiary. Instead of uh, forced labor or, uh, you know, torture or things of that nature for prison, uh, the penitentiary, uh, to go, when you commit a crime, you're, you are tried and you're imprisoned and you sit in, in a cell and you think about your actions uh, by yourself. Um, that whole concept of, uh, of a penitentiary uh, to encourage uh, a penitent spirit to think and reflect on your actions. So this is sort of what's behind uh, the, the theory of the penitentiary. So Tocqueville and Beaumont were interested in studying this. They hatched an idea to go to America 
and study prisons. Uh, study the penitentiary system in, in Pennsylvania and in New York especially. Um, but they were also interested in American political institutions and in democracy. And so they uh, sort of had a dual purpose in going to America. Their ostensible purpose was to go to America to study prisons and hopefully the French government would sponsor them on that. If they were able to go and do that, then they would get out of the watchful gaze of the government and of the regime. They would be able to take some of the heat off of them, be able to sign the loyalty oath and not, not face any, any serious re repercussions at home. And the plan was to spend two years uh, in America, traveling through, and then they were gonna write a book. They were gonna write a book on prisons in America. Um, and that way they would uh, be able to escape those pressures at home. And Tocqueville and Beaumont were successful in convincing the French government to let them go. They, they secured official commissions from the Ministry of the Interior in February of 1831, and they departed France on April the 2nd of 1831. But Tocqueville and Beaumont, while they were interested in prison reform, they were really interested in America. They were really interested in Republican institutions, democracy, uh, in, in America. They were interested in American culture. Um, America was a new democracy, a new experiment, and the whole world was talking about America. They were fascinated with it, and so they uh, both were really keen on looking into American culture, American political culture especially. They wanted to identify lessons in America that maybe France could learn. After all, France had been through revolutions, they had been through a dictatorship under Napoleon, they just experienced another revolution in July, America had been through a revolution. So perhaps there will be some lessons that American democracy could offer to the French. When Tocqueville wrote Democracy in America, his audience is primarily a French one. It's not an American one, it's not, a, not an English speaking audience primarily, it's a primarily a French one. And Tocqueville writes as an aristocratic outsider looking in to American Republican culture. Um, when you read Democracy in America, you'll see that Tocqueville is not an uncritical admirer of America. He's not an uncritical admirer of democracy. He's very suspicious of democracy. But he did believe that democracy was providentially supplanting aristocracy. Over the course of the centuries, traced back all the way back to the Middle Ages, in something of a world movement that was providential. It was even being directed by God himself. And he wanted to go to America to see if he could find in America, uh, the way he put it, he said, means of rendering it profitable to mankind. That's what is on his mind when he writes his book. Now third, what, what was America like when he came? Well, Andrew Jackson was finishing his first term Indian removal was underway. Indian removal that took place from 1830 to 1838. The Creeks, the Chickasaws, the Cherokees, the Seminoles, the Choctaws were being, were being forcibly expelled from their ancestral lands um, to points west of the Mississippi. In 1831, in the summer of 1831, the Nat Turner Rebellion, the largest slave rebellion uh, on, North American, um, on the North American mainland took place in Virginia. The nullification, pro, uh, the nullification uh, crisis was uh, underway. Uh, between 1828 and 1833, <laughs> South Carolina very, very close, uh, came very close to seceding from the Union over the issue of the tariff. And that was, that was certainly a live issue when Tocqueville came to America and he writes about it. Um, he writes about it and references it in his book. The United States looked a lot differently in 1831 when he came here. Um, its boundaries were different. Uh, westward expansion had not uh, been completed, of course. In fact, the United States uh, territory did not extend into what we know of as now the American Southwest. Uh, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, Nevada, Wyoming, Colorado, these, these were not, this was not American territory, this was Mexican territory. We hadn't had the Mexican War yet. Um, the United States and, and Britain uh, shared uh, joint possession, joint stewardship over the Oregon Territory that extended um, up to the present boundary 
between uh, British Columbia, uh, the northern boundary of British Columbia today. So America looked a lot different. Um, the, ex the extent of white settlement in the United States was, um, you know, right, right around here, right around uh, a north-south axis going through, going through Louisville, Kentucky. In fact, one of the things that Tocqueville and Beaumont wanted to do was see the frontier. And so they took a trip through uh, Michigan from Detroit to Saginaw when it was unbroken wilderness. Uh, so America looked a lot different uh, than it does today, a very different world. America also had a much more religious culture than we are used to today. The Second Great Awakening was, was well underway in the 1830s. Uh, this was something of a, of a democratic religion, a democratic faith. Um, Methodists and Baptists were growing exponentially among many other groups, like, uh, like the Christian church, the Disciples of Christ, were exploding in numbers. You had the growth of voluntary uh, associations that were popping up all over the place in the Union. The American Bible Society, uh, the American Home Missionary Society, the Sunday School Union, the Temperance Society, the New York Anti-Tobacco Society, uh, various anti-slavery societies, the anti-slavery movement, the nationwide abolitionist movement really gets going in earnest in 1831 uh, with the publication of The Liberator by William Lloyd Garrison. Uh, local societies, some with very strange names, uh, like the Ladies' Association for the Benefit of Gentlewomen of Good Family Reduced in Fortune Below the State of Comfort to which they have been accustomed. Uh, that was a, a society in New York. All, all this historical background is necessary for us to think historically about democracy in America. He entered and exited America during a particular time, at a particular moment in the American experience that is long gone. Having come to America in late April of 1831 and having left American shores in February of 1832, we're given a window, short window, into the life and career of the United States of America. And that, that, that country's gone. We have to consider change over time. The world of the past is a foreign country, as historians like to say. Um, lots of water under the bridge since 1832 in American history. Sometimes Tocqueville is called a prophet. Tocqueville was not a prophet, and Tocqueville didn't consider himself to be a prophet. Tocqueville had very strong belief in free will and human free will and human responsibility. He did believe in divine providence, but he never considered himself a prophet, so I think it's, it's wrong to call him a prophet. I do think it's right to say he was very prescient, he was very wise, you know, he's extraordinarily insightful, especially for his age. The man was just in his mid-twenties when he came to America, and the things that he says uh, about American democracy, prospects for American democracy, prospects for institutions, prospects for American growth on the world stage, e even to compare America with Russia and to say that Russia and America will be the two great powers in the future. I mean, you read this stuff and it's amazing in his ability to look ahead and to sort of predict accurately a lot of things. But he gets a lot of things wrong, too. You gotta remember that. He's not a prophet, although he is extraordinarily insightful. <coughs> the America that he uh, goes to is, is um, an, interesting, um, an interesting place. It's like taking, when you read Democracy in America, it's like, it's like taking a trip back in time. But that America is gone. It is not the object of our aspirations. We are not trying to get back to America of the 1830s. And overly nostalgic thinking about 19th century America is, uh, is futile, and it really misses the point of democracy in America. So, with that in mind, how is the book useful today? And how was the book received at the time? Well, volume one was written and published in 1835 and volume two was published five years later, in 1840. Tocqueville, of course, is writing against his own historical background. The French Revolution, the reign of terror, uh, the rise and fall of Napoleon, the rise and fall of the Bourbon monarchy under the Restoration, the July Revolution, the monarchy of Louis Philippe, which was itself overturned in 1848. But the common denominator 
common denominator in all this is political and social instability. France is not a stable political system since 1789. With the 1789 revolution, you have precedents that are set. And that precedent is, a, is an unstable political and social system. He was looking for lessons from America. He talks about this in the introduction on how Fr the French could experience, uh, excuse me, how the Americans could experience uh, revolution and initiate a republican form of democracy and yet avoid the instability that his own country had suffered and continued to suffer. So what is it that, what is it that the Americans have that the French can, can maybe acquire for themselves so that we can, you know, establish political and social stability in the face of, of the instability that we have experienced since 1789. This is what's on his mind. Volume one was received as a masterpiece, made him famous. In fact, he celebrated his new fame by getting married and moving into the Tocqueville Chateau that his mother had been uh, inhabiting before him. It established him as a political and social intellectual, and he was recognized as a brilliant thinker in England, in America, and in France. Uh, when he wrote Volume 2, it was not received as enthusiastically as Volume 1. Uh, nevertheless, the combined volumes were seen then and continue to be seen now as the most far-reaching <coughs> and insightful work on American institutions and culture. Now let's talk about some themes in, in the book. Um, while we want to think historically about democracy in America and talk about context, there's much, much to learn from the content of the book. As I said earlier, every American should read this book, but keeping in mind the things we mentioned about historical context and how he uses his terms. The terms that he uses are terms that are bandied about still quite commonly, but he means things that are a little bit different th then than he than, than often how the culture takes the terms. Democracy in America is an exploration of how to preserve liberty against despotism. That's what the book is about. How to preserve liberty against despotism. And there are three key terms uh, that we're going to encounter as we read uh, this, this great book. Equality, democracy, and liberty. These are the three basic terms uh, that we have to really know where Tocqueville is coming from if we're going to understand and appreciate this book. First, equality. Now, we use equality uh, today. Now, we use it all the time. C certainly equality is at the very heart of the American project, going all the way back to the Declaration of Independence. What did Tocqueville mean when he talked about equality? Well, he meant mobility, social mobility economic mobility, political mobility, and even physical and geographical mobility. Not, sta not sameness, uh, not a flattening out necessarily, not, not, um, uh, not even in terms of equal opportunity or something like that. He, he's talking about rags to riches and riches to rags. So a person can be born in obscurity, born on the frontier, born in poverty, and rise to the heights of political power. Does that remind you of anybody maybe in his time? Andrew Jackson, who had been born on the South Carolina Tennessee frontier, born in poverty, born in obscurity, he rose to become the President of the United States. Uh, that's something that occurs in America. That is a product of equality of conditions. That, that being able to move up the social, political, and economic ladder. You, you can uh, you can enter into business as an entrepreneur, work really hard, you know, make sacrifices, and you can become wealthy. But you can also, by irresponsibility, by frittering away your resources, you can go from great wealth to poverty. You go up and down. In France, you, you don't have that mobility. You don't have that movement up and down the socioeconomic or political ladder. Because in France, you still have a feudal society in many ways. You still have aristocracy, you still have hereditary privilege. That doesn't exist in America in the same way that it did in, in France. Uh, in America, you, you can move up and down that ladder. In America, you have a widely shared education. Uh, you have egalitarian ideas about religion. You have um, 
no, bar no significant barriers in terms of social relationships and, and institutions. Uh, those voluntary associations that are popping up all over the Union, uh, those voluntary associations fill the role that either the aristocracy historically has played in Europe or simply the government. Um, those are all aspects of equality in Tocqueville's understanding. Now secondly would be democracy. Uh, democracy is a term we use today. Uh, we apply that term to uh, uh, the American form of government, rightly so. What does Tocqueville mean when he talks about democracy? Well, we often think of democracy as, as being synonymous with equality. Um, we think about it being synonymous or at least really complementary with, with liberty. Um, Tocqueville did see democracy and equality as being very closely uh, related, almost, almost synonymous together, um, especially within the context of society. So think democracy and think equality as being very closely related in Tocqueville's mind. Tocqueville also had a, a, a political conception of democracy, the sovereignty of the people, for example. Um, this is the basic element of American democracy. Even though there are, you know, um, elements in American uh, government uh, that are not the products of di direct democracy, uh, like the Supreme Court, you know, the Supreme Court justices are, are nominated by the President, confirmed by the Senate, serve them a life term. They're not elected by the people. So you might say, well, that's, that's not democratic. Well, Tocqueville would say, no, it's, it's democratic because at the basis of the system, even of the process of, um, of a Supreme Court justice taking his or her post. At the very basis of the system is that the people are sovereign. The president is elected uh, by the people through the states. The Senate at the time was, uh, the senators were elected by the state represented, uh, by the state assemblies, but they're elected by the people. Those, those state representatives are elected by the people. Today, of course, um, it's a little bit different. The Senate is directly elected by the people. And so democracy, sovereignty of the people form the basis of even those things that might not look very democratic, like, um, like a Supreme Court justice taking his or her office. So sovereignty of the people, majority rule, this is really critical in Tocqueville's understanding of a democracy. It's key, the majority rules in a democracy. Uh, broad suffrage, by the 1830s you have the beginnings of universal male suffrage uh, in, in America, which, you know, today by our standards, uh, women of course were not allowed to vote. Those under the age of 21 were not allowed to vote. Obviously African Americans were not allowed to vote. Um, this was universal manhood suffrage. But at the time, um, this was the most sort of liberal and progressive understanding of suffrage in the whole world. And Tocqueville is commenting on that as well. And then liberty or freedom. Now think about liberty, think about this term in terms of or maybe related to the term citizenship. Um, liberty, freedom, and equality are not to be understood in Tocqueville's book as synonymous or even um, um, related. I mean, they're, they're almost at war with one another. They're almost mutually exclusive. Um, in a democracy, uh, in, a, in an equal society, a, a society of equal, which, which is governed by equality of conditions, liberty is under threat. And again, when I use the term liberty in, in Tocqueville's way, think citizenship. Think citizenship. Active, responsible, free citizenship is under threat by equality of conditions. And I'll explain a little bit more about that here in a minute. Uh, freedom is also understood in Tocqueville's mind as a moral freedom. Human beings are born free, they're born responsible for their actions and for their choices. And Tocqueville talks about liberty in terms of particular liberties like freedom of the press, uh, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, uh, voluntary associations. These things are, you know, individual liberties, the products of a free society. But this is where I, I bring in citizenship. Tocqueville's understanding of freedom, Tocqueville's understanding of liberty have to be seen through the lens of active 
citizenship, what, what Tocqueville calls public spirit. Everybody, is a, uh, everybody who's a citizen has a stake in a local, uh, a local polity, like a town, uh, like a county. You have a little bit of ownership. You have a little bit of power as a citizen. You don't have a lot of power. But you have a little bit of power as a citizen. Uh, you have the power to speak. You have the power to speak your, your mind, say at a town, a town meeting. And in speaking your mind, you have the power to influence other people that are in the room hearing you. You have the power to write. You have the power to speak in, through the press, in a newspaper. You can, that, that's a little bit of power that you have. Of course, you have the power to cast a vote, cast a ballot. You have the power to run for office. And even if it's something small, like a, you know, like a constable, or even something like a dog catcher or something like that, you, have, you possess a little bit of power, and that little bit of power that you have as a citizen, when combined with other citizens, equals a great deal of power. So citizenship is understood this way. It's understood as having a little bit of power and using that power in a responsible uh, way uh, for the benefit of yourself as an individual, but also for the benefit of your locality, for the, for the common good. A balance between your private interests, your private desires, your private needs, your private dreams and aspirations, and also the good of the community as a whole. So freedom, liberty, Active citizenship, public spirit, these things have to be secured. They have to be guarded. They have to be defended. They have to be fought for. They have to be exercised in small, ordinary, but consistent and careful and responsible ways. So democracy and equality are often at odds to, with, with each other. People, Tocqueville says, you'll see this in the book when you read, people will trade their liberty for equality. They will sacrifice liberty for equality, but they will not sacrifice equality for liberty. Uh, Tocqueville will say that equality yields instant gratification, while liberty's benefits are hard won, they take time, they take patience to realize, and they can be lost. Equality yields um, like materialism, like materialism like a pursuit of the almighty dollar. And that can yield selfishness, which leads to centralization in the government, which then results in democratic despotism. So in, in other words, as long as the government will, will, will pr protect our ability to make, to make money, we'll, we'll be glad to yield some of our liberties in order to enrich ourselves materially. Uh, we might have, a, we might have a, a, a government that takes care of all of, our, all of our wants and needs, you know, sort of like a nanny state. And we'll, we'll be okay with that as long as we can have our creature comforts. That's, that's what Tocqueville is really saying about that, that um, uh, disconnect between equality and, and freedom. So how can liberty be preserved in a democracy? Well, there's three things uh, that you'll see. Uh, aspects of citizenship uh, that Tocqueville talks about. Public spirit being one of them, voluntary associations being another one, and then third, the formation of what he calls the mores, or the customs, the manners of the people. And let me just say real briefly a few things about that and then we can be done here. Public spirit, um, he talks about this in the context of his visiting New England the townships of Connecticut especially, he was very impressed by. Freest, the freest people in America, he said, live in New England, live in the towns of New England. Uh, they exhibit uh, you know, a public spirit in that each citizen has, takes ownership of a little bit of a piece of the township. And each person has a really strong attachment to their town, almost like a, a patriotic love for the town. And that, that, that kind of feeling, that sort of sentiment and an emotional attachment for the town, uh, Tocqueville said, there is no sure guarantee uh, of, of, or uh, let me, I'm sorry, I'm getting this wrong. There is no sure guarantee or order and tranquility, and yet nothing is more difficult to create than public spirit. That's what he says there. Um, it's drawn from the power and independence of the town, 
Uh, people are, are drawn towards power. Human nature gravitates towards power. Um, and New England towns have a little bit of power and have a little bit of independence. You know, and a citizen um, is different than a subject uh, in an aristocratic society in that subjects don't have any power. They don't have a stake or they don't have any ownership over the town, but a citizen does because a citizen is not a subject. Local interests of the towns are closer to the people than the interests of like the county or uh, the state government. That's, those, are, those are a long way. Those are far away from the local township, the local concerns of the township. Mm -hmm. um, the federal government is even farther away uh, from the township. So local power, local feeling, local attachment, attachment to, you know, family, attachment to community. These things are where democracy really bubbles up from. Doc democracy doesn't come from the federal government down. Democracy starts at the bottom and works its way up. In fact, he will say that the township and the, lo the local polity, the local community, is the school of democracy. It's where we learn as citizens how to be free and how to be responsible and how to cultivate that public spirit. And public spirit is necessary uh, for the welfare of, of, our, um, of our communities. Now voluntary associations, really fascinating. He talks about these in both volume one and volume two. He says Americans, you know, start voluntary societies for all kinds of different things. To, to start hospitals, schools, uh, inns and prisons and churches and mission work, literacy, uh, all kinds of different reasons. Temperance. Um, you know, people were pouring, pouring their whiskey bottles, pouring the, the, the whiskey out into the gutter all over the place because of voluntary associations. He said, wherever at the head of some new undertaking you see a government in France, a man of rank in England, but in the United States you're sure to find an association of people. A group of people will get together, for example, in a local town, a local community. They'll find some problem, you know. Uh, maybe there's a, a, a rut in the road that needs to be fixed, the, the road that leads into the market, into the town. Um, the people will get, get together and they'll just fix it. They won't ask the government to help. They won't ask the, the, the richest man in the community to come and, come and do it. They'll, they'll just get together and they'll just do it. Um, in a voluntary society, you have the, the sort of an art of pursuing a common object in the, of the citizen's common de uh, desires and just getting it done. Um, and this is something that comes up from the bottom. This is a motivation from the people uh, to get things done. Uh, voluntary associations are very still, still very important today. You think about um, you know, social, civic, political associations. You have a group of people uh, that come together. They, they may be um, old, they may be young, they may be uh, they may be white, they may be brown, they may be black, they may be religious people, they may not be religious people, some of them may have voted Democratic, some of them may be voted Republican, but none of that matters in a, in a voluntary society. What matters is everybody comes together for one common goal, and they all agree on that one common goal. And despite their differences, they unite together to pursue that common goal. And they have to work together, and they have to resolve their differences in order to reach that common goal. It, it's sort of a, a, of a mark of the genius of the American system, and it marks it off uh, and separate from even the British and definitely the French system. Finally, the manners of the people. The meaning and role of the manners, the mores, the customs, these three words can all you be used synonymously. In America, you'll see that Tocqueville will say this at the end of volume one, you have, you have laws. You know, the laws of the, of the land. But where do the laws come from? They come from the manners. They come from the customs of the people. And the manners, the customs of the people, are more powerful than even the laws. Because the customs and the manners, those things don't change on a dime. Whereas laws do change on a dime. And the laws reflect the manners of the customs of the people. Tocqueville calls the manners, he calls them habits of the heart. He says that they represent the whole moral and the intellectual character of the people. And the mores, Tocqueville observed, are influenced mostly by religion. 
uh, Christian morality, uh, which um, are, of course, communicated from the pulpits of the country. And the manners are key to the preservation of, of a free democracy uh, in America, key to the protection of democracy in America against uh, the democratic despotism and the despotic tendencies that are inherent in an equal society. He took manners very seriously. Let me read you a brief quote. So seriously do I insist upon this head that if I have hitherto failed in making the reader feel the important influence of the practical experience, the habits, the opinions, in short, the customs of the Americans upon the maintenance of their institutions, I have failed in the principal aspect of my work. So in other words, if, if Tocqueville hasn't really impressed upon us the importance of the manners, the customs, the mores, then Tocqueville, by his own admission, says, I failed. I failed in the, in the entire project. In the formation of right manners, you have the key to the preservation of liberty. Morals, virtue, these things are very important, but virtue, not in the same sense as, say, the founders thought about virtue. The application of virtue would be in very small and ordinary actions on the part of Americans uh, through what he called self-interest rightly understood. Uh, people uh, in America will, will, will do things that are virtuous. They'll do things that are, uh, you know, on behalf of their fellow man. They'll make small sacrifices uh, for the good of the society because it gets them something too. Uh, think, think about our, ourselves. We, we might give to charity uh, because we, we know at the end of the year we'll, we'll get a tax write-off on, on what we give. So that's like a, a, a present-day expression of self-interest rightly understood. Um, taking taking sort of selfish elements in human nature and directing them to a productive end, productive purpose. To conclude, and we'll uh, break up and go into our seminars here in a minute, but to conclude, Tocqueville's analysis of the American and uh, the political social structure of America in the 1830s, still instructive today, even though it's a historical artifact, even though when we read Democracy in America, we are looking into a window of time, uh, of a world that's gone by, it's still useful to us today because so much about human nature stays the same. Tocqueville's work is uh, full of wisdom on many, many topics, such as the role of religion, education, the family, race prejudice, which he spends the longest chapter uh, in both volumes, he talks about race. Uh, which, is, which is really amazing. Uh, interest rightly understood, you know, public spirit, democratic despotism, tyranny of the majority, all these things are still very applicable for us today. And he offers sort of a program <coughs> to protect liberty against democratic despotism. America 2023, very different than the America of 1831, but America faces dangers. American democracy faces dangers that Tocqueville warned against, even still. This doesn't make him a prophet. Tocqueville's not a prophet. But it does mean that Tocqueville is extremely important for us today. Um, we can recall, you know, Tocqueville had a very high view of human freedom and human responsibility. He rejected historical inevitabilities. But Tocqueville's prescience, Tocqueville's wisdom, Tocqueville's insights into American institutions in American culture make this writing uh, uniquely relevant to us today. Through watchfulness, wisdom, the cultivation of public spirit, we can ourselves arrest the drift towards democratic despotism as Tocqueville is our instructor. Well, thank you very much. I look forward to our further discussions.